Tensions in West Asia escalate. Iran fires over 300 missiles and drones at Israel in retaliation to the attack on Iranian embassy in Damascus. Most munitions were intercepted with no loss of life. Israel weighs a response even as Tehran says its operation is over. The U.S. Secretary General also calls for de-escalation at a special Security Council meeting last night. Wall Street sells off on Friday with key indices correcting about a percent and a half. Stock futures rebound even as investors brace for Israel's response to Iran's strike over the weekend. Asian markets open with losses, while the gift nifty suggesting a lower start for the Indian market. Crude prices stick slightly lower despite rising geopolitical tensions in West Asia with Brent around $90 a barrel. Gold trades around $2,400 an ounce on safe haven demand. TCS kicks off the earnings season on a positive note. Revenue growth is modest, but margins hits a three-year high and deal wins are at record levels over $13 billion. The management also expects FY25 growth to be better than that in FY24. Inflation eases to 4.85% in March, the slowest pace of growth in the last 10 months. But food prices remain elevated with vegetable inflation at 28%. Core inflation cools for the 10th straight month. Industrial production in February accelerates by 5.7%, the highest pace of growth in the last four months. Good morning in the Mumbai News Centre. I'm Sonal Bhutra and you're watching Power Breakfast. Well, it's been a very busy weekend. There's so much to talk about in terms of geopolitical tensions. And of course, we got that macro data as well. But let's get to the top story today. Iran launched a drone and missile attack against Israel in retaliation to Israel's attack on their embassy in Syria. U.S. President Joe Biden has urged for restraint in terms of Israel's response to Iran's drone attack warning Israel's Prime Minister that the U.S. would not take part in any counter-offensive against Iran. NBC's Alice Barr reports. President Biden is urging restraint as the Israeli war cabinet weighs its response after Iran launched an unprecedented wave of more than 300 drones and missiles at Israel. Nearly all of the attacks were shot down by Israeli, U.S. and other allies' forces, and no one was killed. But a seven-year-old girl hit by shrapnel is in critical condition. President Biden meeting with members of the G7, pressing for a diplomatic solution. The president's been very clear. We don't seek a war with Iran. We're not looking for escalation here. We will continue to help Israel defend itself. President Biden told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu the U.S. will not participate in any counter-offensive against Iran. That according to a senior administration official who also told NBC News that the president urged Netanyahu not to retaliate since the Iranian attack appeared to have caused minimal casualties and damage. Israeli President Isaac Herzog speaking out. We always listen to our partners and allies. We respect their view. We are also always uh, reviewing all our options. And as I said, we will take whatever it takes to protect and defend our people. Some Republican lawmakers accusing the Biden administration of emboldening Iran. This administration's failing to say there is a red line. There should be a red line. Iran says the matter is now considered concluded, calling its attacks revenge for an airstrike on the Iranian embassy compound in Syria. Though no U.S. forces have been attacked, President Biden said America will remain vigilant to all threats. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. Of course, this is a story that we'll keep getting more updates on, but let's listen in to David Roche of Independent Strategy talking about Iran's attack on Israel and the impact. The question is how big the retaliation is. Uh, does it actually limit itself to Revolutionary Guard uh, assets offshore? Does it actually bomb the Revolutionary Guards onshore? That would be limiting it to, to, to simply military targets. Or does it go for economic and uh, even for Iran's nuclear uh, facilities? Uh, so you have all degrees of uh, escalation that are possible, but escalation you would get uh, there's no doubt about that. Even if the Israeli response for the moment is limited, you have to remember that the real escalation issue in Israel is.
Okay, all right. Uh, that is the update coming in as far as the geopolitical tensions are concerned in the West Asia. But let's now look at the Asian markets because they have been reacting to all these developments over the weekend and are largely lower right now. Taiwanese index down 115 points. We have Hang Seng, which is sitting with cuts of around 1.5%. And that's the story across the Asian markets. Nikkei too is sitting with cuts of around one odd percent. And if we look at the gift nifty, because that's the indicator of how Indian markets would do, it's a 130 point cut that we're seeing uh, uh, in the gift nifty indicating that this could be another weekday for our own markets as well but let's talk about the u.s markets wall street tumbled on friday the dow jones was down 475 points while s p suffered worst day since january the nasdaq also fell over one and a half percent shares of jp morgan's chase fell over six percent after the banking giant posted its first quarter results the bank said net interest income could be a little short of what wall street analysts are expecting in 2024 According to the University of Michigan survey of consumers, the consumer sentiment index for April came in at 77.9, below the Dow Jones consensus estimate of 79.9. Year ahead and long-run inflation expectations also ticked up, reflecting frustration over sticky inflation. Let's uh, now listen in to BlackRock CEO Larry Fink as he talks about U.S. markets and the big inflation number. I, I think two is a hard number. We have restructured how we frame our economic policy. We have a trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus in the CHIPS Act, the Infrastructure Act, and the IRA. Um, we have very poor legal immigration policies that have restricted, and that is all inflationary in jobs. And then the bigger issue is how we think about how we spend our incremental dollars. As We're spending a lot more money on services. So if you think about where Service inflation is really the main culprit of high elevated inflation. Okay, we are talking about high inflation. Then, of course, commodities come to our mind. Let's get in Manisha Gupta. She's joining you with all the update from the commodity space. Manisha, what's happening here? Well, uh, you know, we are trading at the higher side of the range. But having said that, after the markets have reacted to on what conspired on Friday and Saturday, we have seen statements come in from U.S. that they will not participate in an Iran-Israel conflict. Also, a statement from Iran saying that the matter can be deemed concluded as of now. So unless Israel does anything else now, the markets do seem that they seem to be settling right now. So we have seen while the crude oil price is holding around to the six-month highs, but we are definitely off those $92 kind of highs that we saw when uh, all of this conflict was actually happening. Same is the case with gold as well. We did see an all-time high of 2412 $2,412 an ounce. But this also has come off below 2400 right now. As I said, the markets are still trading on the higher side of the range. But from its highs, we've seen some profit taking coming in. For this week, it's going to be about the Chinese first quarter GDP numbers. Will that come in on Tuesday? And then you have Japan March trade data. That comes in on Wednesday. You have Japan inflation numbers to react to as well. The dollar index is trading on a firmer note. That seems to be putting pressure onto the prices. Uh, within the metals as well, it is about uh, UK and US uh, putting bans on Russian metals. That seems to be supporting metal prices. So barring the industrial metals, everything else is off its highs as we trade in Asia. Okay, all right. So that's what's happening in the commodity space. Thank you so much, Manisha, for joining us as always and giving us uh, that update. <laughs> it's time for a short break now. When we return, we'll tell you how these global queues will impact our own markets in our Power Prep segment. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Power Bref Breakfast on CNBC TV 18. It's time to welcome our research team joining with what the trade setup is looking like, the stocks that are likely to be in the news and the action from the FNO space as well. Hey guys, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, Hormas, let me come across to you first up. A busy weekend and looks like it could be a busy day as well. Busy day indeed. Yeah. And when it comes to the markets, to be very honest, we are sitting on the fence right now because there are multiple factors that support a further correction, but there are multiple factors that may lend support as well. Now to talk about a further correction, well, 
US market sold off sharply on Friday. The escalation in tensions between Iran and Israel over the weekend. The 10-year Treasury yields now at 4.5% and gold price is also surging on haven demand. So plenty of factors that support a further correction. And Friday, the Indian markets themselves sold off very sharply. And the Nifty gave up all the gains for the week, as did the Nifty Bank. Both the indices ended absolutely flat for the week. And But what may lend support, though, is that Iran and Israel both have spoken about no further escalation with US deciding to not participate in the conflict. The crude oil prices have not seen an extreme reaction to this. Both Brent and NYMEX are flat this morning. The back, macro factors may also support because the CPI inflation fell to a 10-month low on Friday. IIP was at a four-month high. And of course, TCS's results may also lend some support on the downside. Institutional numbers will also have to be washed out for because FIs were heavy sellers in the market uh, on Friday, over 8,000 crores worth of selling. What we need to watch out for today, of course, crude oil sensitives, metal stocks, of course, because of the sanctions on the Russian LME, uh, gold financiers, and of course, the IMD presser later today on the monsoon outlook. The gift nifty, as of now, though, is indicating a gap down start on the market but hopefully it may get bought into at lower levels back to you okay yes yeah, so it has recovered from the lows as well so we'll have to see which way things go thank you Ormas, for that but let's not forget a lot of stocks that will be on our radar Mamakshi has that list good morning Mamakshi. well good morning sona let me first start off with tcs the company reported its fourth quarterly numbers uh, revenue growth uh, in uh, constant currency terms was slightly below estimates uh, but the margins were much better and as a result the net profit was higher than cnbc tv18's poll uh, the total contract value also was at a uh, uh, was a record in fact standing at 13.2 billion dollars anand rati's revenue grew by almost 29% net profit was up 33% and the company has announced a buyback they will be buying back shares worth almost 165 crores. Senko Gold has reported 28% revenue growth for FY24, 39% in the fourth quarter and same store sales growth for the year stood at 19%. Kolte Patil reported the highest ever annual sales uh, of almost 2,822 crores. This is an uptick of almost 26% on a year-on-year -year basis. Patanjali's edible oil segment revenue was up in mid uh, in single digits sequentially. Volumes was up in mid single digits and the revenue of the food and FMCG business business remained resilient. ISMT uh, has received two contracts worth almost 344 crores from ONGC as the DM Healthcare has declared a special dividend of 118 rupees per share. Ami Organics will be raising up to 500 crores via QIP and lastly Granules India will be in focus because Unit 5 facility in Vishakhapatnam was inspected by the uh, USFD and issued zero observations. Okay, all right. So those are some stocks that will be on our radar. Thank you, Amakshi, for that. Finally, Mangnam is joining in with all the cues from the FNO space. Hey, Mangnam, morning. Good morning. So before all the Middle East crisis, you know, even on Friday, the market faced some resistance at highs and we saw some decline for all the frontline indices and the mid-cap index on Friday itself. The Nifty Bank, however, was a mild outperformer. Uh, the Nifty is facing congestion a little above that 22,700 mark, something that we've seen of the last three, four trading sessions itself. So between, uh, you know, 22,700 and a record high, there could be some supplies coming in. But that's not for today. Today, the question is, uh, where does the market get bought into? Because the gift nifty is suggesting a big downtick of almost 130 points. What is weighing down on the markets are US macros and Middle East tensions. But what may act as a counterbalancing support is the IT space because TCS uh, margins were above expectations and we have a big amount of uh, important results this uh, week itself. Cash market flows, the FIs are selling about 8,000 crores in cash and not just that, they also sold about 2,000 crores in index futures. But most of that selling was directed towards Nifty, telling you that the Nifty bank may continue to outperform the way it has. The FI long exposure is still 56%. The net longs are at around that 30,000 contracts. So that is something we'll have to monitor even as the market wades through this volatility. On the way up, 22,650 to 22,700 seems like a bit of a resistance and that's where the 22,600 call writers are active. But at the same time, there is support around 22,200 at the lower level. And the key to track today's trading session would be the 20-day moving average. That would be the first test of any strength in the market. 22,270 is where the 20-day moving average of the Nifty is. Just watch out for TCS. The other thing that I'm watching out for, whether it sustains much beyond that 4,100 rupees mark on the share, that's largely because the 4,000 call has maximum open interest with a premium of 95 rupees. Okay, all right. Thanks, Mangdam, for all those cues. So that's our power prep segment. It's time to now talk about some important earnings. IT Bellwether, TCS reported its fourth quarter earnings on Friday. The company reported a big beat in margins and clocked in record deal wins. However, missed revenue expectations. Reema is joining us with the key highlights from the fourth quarter numbers and her analysis as well. Good morning, Reema. 
Hi, good morning. I think you summarized it beautifully. Uh, a modest mist on revenues, a big beat on margins and record high deal wins for the quarter and a very strong finish in for the full year in terms of deal wins too. So top line growth has come in at 1.1% in constant currency terms. Slightly lower than street expectations, but similar to the December quarter. So no material improvement seen in demand. Margins is where the company positively surprised. Margins expanded by 100 basis points to come in at 26% ahead of street expectations. And deal wins at $13.2 billion is a record for the company. And even for the full year, the TCV is up 25%. Headcount, though, has declined for the third consecutive quarter. The company, in its uh, you know, commentary, has said FY25 will be better than FY24. Brokerage verdict then. JP Morgan has upgraded TCS to an overweight, raised the target price to 4500 They believe TCS will do better than the rest of the large-cap IT peers in FY25. Goldman Sachs, too, has a buy call, and they're saying there is an increasing probability of a double-digit earnings growth in FY25 at the EPS level. UBS, HSBC, too, are bullish in the stock with a buy rating. Nomura, though, has a reduced uh, call with the target price down to 3250 But just one word, bear in mind, on Friday, the stock had already outperformed. It was up half a percent at a time when the Nifty IT index was down 1%. Back to you. Okay, all right. So that is the analysis on TCS's numbers. In fact, TCS MD and CEO K. Kriti Vasan spoke to CNBC Asia on the growth outlook for the company following the fourth quarter earnings. Listen in. We had a very good uh, last four quarters where we are order book has been very strong. We in fact, booked close to forty more than forty billion dollars of order book in the last one year. And it's also second thing we believe that. Uh, Many of the uh, organizations or companies have uh, been deferring the technological upgrades or transformation. Like they have, they carry a tech debt now for quite some time. And so these two factors put together, we believe once there is a certainty in the minds of our ca ca customers about uh, the growth in the near term or medium term for them, the uh, tech spend will re resume. So our uh, hypothesis based on that uh, assumption that uh, there is enough tech debt and we have won enough orders, so it has to build help us or growth in the near in the medium term. And of course, stay tuned to CNBC TV 18 as we'll be speaking to TCS CEO K. Kriti Vasan and Chief Operating Officer NG Subramaniam at 825 later this morning. CFO Samir Sikhsarya and Chief Human Resources Officer Milan Luckard will also join in at 8.40 a.m. So stay tuned for that conversation. Let's step into a break now. Up next, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman speaks exclusively to Network 18. We'll get you the excerpts from the interview after this short break. So stay tuned for that. Welcome back. Uh, you're still tuned into Power Breakfast on CNPC TV 18. It's time to talk about the latest updates on the political front. The BJP released its manifesto, Sankalp Patra, at the party headquarters in Delhi yesterday. Prime Minister Narendra Modi said the manifesto focuses on the four pillars of developed India, that is women, youth, farmers and the poor. The implementation of Uniform Civil Code and the One Nation, One Poll are also the key highlights of the BJP's 2024 manifesto. The government will continue its focus on expanding domestic defence manufacturing and exports of indigenous equipment and will work towards energy independence by 2047 and reduce petroleum imports. The government also promises to invest in a nationwide EV charger network and promises to further simplify GST portal especially for MSMEs. The manifesto also promises to continue free ration scheme for the next five years and free electricity to poor households. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, uh, before we uh, talk about the interview that Network 18 exclusively had with Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman, let's quickly take a look at the Asian markets because there's been a fall that we've been seeing in the Asian markets as well. Uh, quickly taking a look at the Taiwanese index, that is lower. We have the Hang Seng, which is lower by 7 tenths of a percent. Hang Seng has actually extended those losses that we've been talking about. 1% lower there, and the Taiwanese index too down 7 tenths of a percent. The Nikkei too is lower right now. That one is down 1.5%, and that's been the case across the Asian markets. In fact, if you look at the GIF Nifty, that one is indicating a start in the negative, though it has recovered from the lows of the day as well. 
Now let's uh, talk about uh, the interview, the exclusive interview. We are focusing towards laying the foundation for taking India through the next 25 years to reach the destination which is developed India, says Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman in an exclusive conversation with CNN News 18 Zakka Jeka. She also spoke on the party's other priority areas. Let's listen into a short excerpt from that conversation. In the 10 years that we have provided the basis for uh, what we can take India to the next level, meaning we should lay the foundation for taking India through the next 25 years to reach the destination which is developed India. So that is the first thing which was in his mind and uh, he ensured that there are indicators for the steps that we are planning to take Indian economy further. But equally, his emphasis was that we should not uh, we should uh, relentlessly pursue the uh, welfare schemes in a way, I don't want to use welfare as a word here, it was more to empower the poorest of the poor and make sure that we are able to support our farmers and provide enough opportunities to skill themselves for the youth and above all and uh, very centrally to this whole thing to keep women not just at the center of policy making, but to keep them up front there so that it will be women led all through. So these four groups on whom he has been talking a lot in the recent past is to ensure that through them, women belonging to various castes or youth belonging to rural urban areas, irrespective of the caste differences or the income differences, Farmers across the country, particularly the small farmers, particularly the kind of farmers who grow um, Sri Anna, that is the coarse yeah. grains, millets and those other superfoods. So emphasis was on these. So everything that we had to do were, was very clearly put through this filter and tested if it will stand the test of time. Above all, I should recognize more than 15 lakh inputs which had come from the people of India saying we'd like you to put this aspect in the budget and I mean in the uh, Sankalp Patra and so on. So we've given a lot of emphasis for those inputs which have come also and the Prime Minister was keen that we go through each one of them and there was a large team sitting and uh, sifting through the inputs which had come. So ma'am, the, the, uh, there are two ends of the pyramid, one at the top end of the pyramid, the manifesto talks about, you know, Viksit Bharat, about putting a manned mission into space, having uh, India's own space station, uh, EV manufacturing hub, and at the bottom end of the pyramid, as you said, there is uh, a welfare stamp, no doubt, whether it is extending the uh, free food, free ration scheme to 80 crore people, whether it is, uh, you know, 3 crore new homes for the poor, and so on and so forth. Isn't there a contradiction between the two? On the one hand, you have a pathway to Viksit Bharat. On the other hand, you also realize that everything is not hunky-dory. Well, I don't want to put it as it's not hunky-dory. It is a matter of reality that we have a section of our population which still needs to be empowered. And that is why you have the PM Garib Kalyan Anna Yojana, which is extended for another five years. You also have a section of our population, which is the farming community, particularly the small farmers, who against all odds, some man-made odds, some nature-made odds, like the climate, extreme weather conditions, are giving us food at the t on our table. So are we not going to support them? And therefore, we made sure that in order to empower the farmers to be able to better perform in their farms, we need to get technology there, get the drones going there, ensure that fertilizer, the dependence on imported fertilizer be brought down and subsidize fertilizer so that the farmer is not paying through his nose for an essential input. So thought has been applied to empowering sections of Indian society which with dignity intact can grow into the system and contribute to the system. Whereas if you talk from the point of view of only Garibi Hatao, you don't seem, the, seem to understand and appreciate the nuance that the policy should take in order to empower them. That is why we have gone to talking about it, not from the point 
okay, we'll keep getting your excerpts of that conversation through the course of the day. But for now, it's curtains down on this edition of Power Breakfast. Stay tuned. Mazar Morning Call comes up next.